you ever created an image and stopped thinking, hey, there's so much more I want to say about this? Well, I do all the time. So I took this portrait and turned it into a short film. You asked me to show you how, so here it is. If you don't want to follow along for the next half hour, I suggest checking out that link above for the much shorter breakdown. So we go to File, Import, Images as Planes. It's an add-on you need to activate. We select our two layers, set the shader to Emission and import it. Now the two images are unaligned. So we go to Shift S, Selection to Active, which will align them with each other. And now we have the arm and the body on different planes lined up. Control tab to go into edit mode, right click subdivide and subdivide a bunch. Now I select my main layer where my character is on, press K for the knife tool and trace the outline of my character. I press W a few times until I get the paint selection tool. I pretty much select all polygons that have character in them. Control E to invert the selection and delete those polygons. Now we do the same thing with the arm. K for the knife tool, trace the outline, select all the polygons that have the arm on it, invert the selection and delete. Shift right click to place the 3D cursor by my hand. Then Shift A, create a cylinder and give it a smaller dimension so we actually see something happening in our screen here. The 3D cursor helped us to place that new object right by my hand so I don't have to shuffle it around through the entire 3D scene. Now I'm just going to place it behind the character so my hand is in front of the cylinder. Shift D to duplicate the handle and Shift Tab to go into edit mode. This helps to keep the pivot of that uh, object in place while we manipulate its boundary, so to say. S, Z to just stretch it out in height. Then I switch back to my grip, go back in edit mode and select the top loop. You can do that by Alt, double clicking on the edge. There you go. Control B to bevel and here we go. Exit, edit mode, select the shaft again. Now place the 3D cursor with Shift C at the top of the shaft. Go into edit mode and select the top elements, the top polygons of that pole. Ctrl D to duplicate and P to separate the new polygons so they are on so that they're their own object. And now we will use that new object for the base of our umbrella. So I scale it up, edit mode, select the center vertex and move it up with GZ. Then I press 2 so I can select every second edge of the umbrella. Press 1 to convert that selection to vertices. Alt deselect the top vertice and only pull the bottom ones down. Hold Z and toggle X-ray mode. Then select all the edges from the side view and Ctrl B to bevel them. This will give our umbrella a much softer appearance. Then with the selection active, Shift D to duplicate those faces and P to separate the selection. Beautiful. Now select this newly created object. And now we want to give it thickness, but our scale is completely off. So Ctrl A to apply scale, now it's 1 instead of 33, head over to modifiers and add a solidifier modifier. With shift left mouse button you can very gently dial in the thickness to your liking. Now select the shaft again, it's a little bit too short or is the umbrella too high? Yeah, let's just, let's just find the middle ground there, hop back into edit mode, select the top vertices and bring them up a bit. Again, apply scale with control. Now I select the top part of the umbrella, the shaft and the handle and press control J to join them into one object and name that umbrella. Beautiful. Now onto those magical dangly things of the umbrella. Uh, control C to place the cursor again, create a cylinder, nothing new here right now and just give it some dimensions that make sense. So this will be the first string Control A to apply scale, 
Shift C to set the 3D cursor and we create another cylinder with Shift A. Give it some dimensions that make sense. This will be the little lantern that dangles on the umbrella. Control tab to jump into edit mode and we select the top and bottom polygon. So you press three and then top and bottom polygon. Control B to bevel those polygons. Then W to paint select the top and bottom faces and delete them. So we have cutouts, beautiful. Shift D to duplicate it, scale it down a bit. Shift A to apply the scale. And then we give that a wire modifier. And now we have a little cage on the inside of our little lantern. So select the dangly thing called string, name the outside pendant and the inside pendant frame. And then select the frame and then the pendant. Control P, keep transformations to parent them to each other. So now the frame moves with the outside. Shift right click to place the 3D cursor and we create a plane. Control tab to jump into edit mode. Rotate the plane so it faces you. Scale Y, so S Y to scale it. So we have a nice strip there. Then press Control R. Before you click, use your mouse wheel to decide how many cuts you want to insert. Now we will parent objects to each other. So string to pendant, control P, keep transformation, pendant to top string, control P, keep transformation, and then that string to the umbrella, also keep transformation. And if I now rotate and move the umbrella, all the pendant elements will move with it. So now we jump into animation. I quickly constrain the arm and the umbrella to the main character, and then move this character into distance so this is an animation as well as rotate the umbrella around itself now we're going to add modifiers to our string select the string modifiers displays create a new texture and name it small set the coordinates to global and direction to normal however now our string has moved away so i disable this modifier quickly hold tap and jump into weight paint mode and paint the top vertices until they're nicely red. Now we head over to object data properties and under vertex group, hit the plus button, give the new vertex group a name you like and assign our selection to that group. Exit edit mode, head over to modifiers, select the vertex group we just created and activate the modifier again. However, now our top is displaced. So let's invert the vertex group. Head down to Texture Properties, create Clouds Texture and set it to Color. This looks much better now. Since our Cloud Texture has RGB information, we actually can switch the direction of our display modifier to XYZ. So now RGB work as XYZ deformers, if that makes sense. The deformation is a bit low poly, so let's add a sub division modifier and move that modifier above our displace modifier and that looks better. Now we add another displace modifier and I go into a little bit more detail in a second. Uh, we just want to have bigger deformations. Create a solidify modifier and push this all the way to the top. Now our ribbon has puffiness to it. I right click shade smooth and jump back into the texture for our big displacement modifier the settings here and in this modifier really depend on your scene scale so you can copy these settings or play around with what you like now i'm going to select all elements of the ribbon shift right click to place my cursor at the center of the umbrella then alt d to duplicate the ribbons and rz to rotate them around the 3d cursor beautiful now use blender kit look for a hat it's a free asset in this case that i used to hide my characters here a bit more to make it a bit more mystical then shift left click to select the main character control p to parent it and done 
well, another day, same tutorial. <laughs> okay, so here's a grind plane. I applied a sympathy former to it. But you see, I want to get that over the hill curve and it's not really bending the right way. So I select that empty as my origin. And when I select it, now I can rotate the empty and actually translate it as well, as you will see shortly, to, to dictate how that sympathy former affects my geometry. So let's just jump into the rotation here, and I think it's rotation Y. Yeah, and here we go. All of a sudden, it does exactly what I want. So I rotated the empty 90 degrees. Now I'm back in the modifier, flatten the curve a bit, apply another sympathy former, set this one to twist, because I want to get a bit of this sideward leaning so that it's not perfectly level and a bit more like, you know, charming. And by moving uh, the empty the course of the beginning, I can also perfectly decide where my high point is. And now we jump into creating the vegetation that is left and right of our path. Um, for that, I used a G scatter. Uh, by Graswald. I believe it's a free add-on. I just subdivide the, uh, the the polygon a bit and delete the middle part so I only have the strips left and right of it. And then I use that as my emitter, select uh, whatever grass I like, disable the proxy preview so I actually see the geometry and then just ramp up the density and that is that. But you can also recreate this without any add-ons. So, I mean, I'm using Blender Kit here right now to get assets in. So I select a few low poly grass elements, um, chuck them all into a collection called grasses. Then I go into my ground plane, go to particles, set the particle system to here. Then you just set a few settings for random rotation, random scale, the usual really. Uh, in this case, I reduced the healings as well because um, I'm not sure if that matters because we actually render the collection grasses. There you go, which has all our grass elements in it. I just bring up the scale a bit. The grasses are not aligned properly, so I just go into the rotation setting, find the axis that works for me, and here we go. Maybe just reduce the grass scale a bit now that we see what's actually doing, bump up the density, and here we go. So here's a shot for the lantern dangling in the wind, and we have a few soft deformations at the base. So the whole moving element is constrained or parented to one empty. There's only one key on frame one for this. So let's just delete this key. There's no animation right now. Press I set a key for rotation and jump into the curve editor and now I'm just going through each axis individually and apply a noise modifier here on the right. Play with scale, strength and offset mainly until I like uh, what I see and should you run into any leaning you can grab that key in the curve and with GY you slide it up and down to correct that pitch you're liking. The soft deformation at the base works exactly the same as our ribbons on the umbrella. We use a displacement modifier to deform the material. And just like with the ribbons, we use a vertex group that we invert to have an area of the material that is not deformed by the noise modifier. Another example is those trees, or more specific, like giving the impression that wind brushes through the branches and move things around a bit. It's really versatile. I love it. Okay, no rest for the wicket. Lighting. So you see the highlight on the ground there, which is coming predominantly from the spotlight that I placed at the very end of that row. So let me quickly draw a render region here for faster feedback. So if I move this area, the spotlight around, you can see how my highlight travels with it. And I placed it right smack under the character where I want you to look at. There's another important light coming right from under the umbrella and that gives highlights on the head and merges my 2D character with its 3D elements. Before we can animate the character, we have to rig him up. So let's hide everything we don't need for that. 
the head as well. Shift right click to place the 3D cursor by my hip. Create an armature single bone. Go into edit mode and place the tip of that bone by my knees. Press E to extrude another bone. Bring that down to my ankles and E again for my feet. Now select the first bone again, E, to bring up the bones for the torso and the arms. Now leave the edit mode and shift select the character. Control P armature with automatic weights. Now let's create a curve, circle, scale it down. Control A to apply the scale. This will be our control element. So select the armature, go into pose mode. Then we go to bone constraint properties and select a child of constraint. And as target, we pick the circle. Then we go on the torso bone, child of constraint, but we pick armature and the first bone, which was our upper leg bone as the target. What that does is it moves our legs with a circle and our upper body with our lower body because that is where we created the first bone. Now let's place the 3D cursor by our ankles, create another circle, apply the scale, go into pose mode, select the bone for our feet, child of constraint, once again under bone constraint properties and select that lower circle as our target. And now th things should move correctly, right? Well, they don't translate, but they rotate. In order to get translation working, we go back into post mode, create an inverse kinematic constraint or short IK, and as target we pick our circle that is right by our ankles. And here we go, moving and rotating. However, something funny is happening. We move our legs and our upper body goes nuts. So we'll fix it in a second. Let's quickly parent the ankles to the hip controller. So then they move in synchronicity. Go back into pose mode for armature and place the 3D cursor just below our neck. Now we create another curve, scale it down, apply scale, and that will be the controller for our upper body. Now jump back into pose mode, select the torso bone, and we will create another inverse kinematics constraint. There it is. We push that above our child of constraint and as target, we pick our new torso control, but it still moves independently. So shift select the root control, parent keep transformation. So everything follows nicely now. And we fixed our upper body deformations when we wanted to move our legs. Beautiful. Okay, so let's go back into pose mode, select our forearm control, inverse kinematic, constrain, and we can't select a target yet because we haven't created a circle for that. So place the 3D cursor by our wrist, create a curve, scale it down, again apply scale, and we go back into the pose mode for our armature, select the new controller as our target, and here's a little trick about IK chains. So let's limit it to one. And if I move my hand now, only everything to the elbow will move. So if I set the length to two and then move my arm, it goes all the way to the shoulder. So it moves down two bones, but no further than the shoulders. Let's repeat the same for the left arm. Nothing new here right now. And parent our left arm to the armature as well as it is on a separate plane. I put it on a separate plane because I needed to have a bit more control over the movement of the arm without deforming the, the jacket. So there's always a bit of weight painting. I don't want the arm movement to move the jacket so much. So I am uh, adding a lot of weight to the torso and the upper body and removing a lot of weights from my left arm joints from the jacket. That looks really good now. And we're going to do the same for the head area. We're just 
remove a lot of the head area from the arm and give it to the shoulders just a just a little bit more so that we isolate the the arm movement from from the head oh how exciting here's our sidekick this butterfly or in general any uh, character that has a very simple torso and a few legs around can lead to a very satisfying and rewarding animation experience you pretty much have a one control for the torso and if you wriggle that around then the legs start to do their thing and it just gives you a lot of movement for free so uh, i guess we jump into it here one speciality is that the wings have a shape key which i use to make the flippity flap but rigging the legs is pretty much like rigging the character that we just done so let's create an armature single bone and line it up with with the geometry of our legs and just trace down the geometry by extruding more bones here lose a little trick to snap the bone to the 3d cursor so you don't have to look around so much we create an ik constraint again create our controller and then parent the foot bone to the controller if it jumps out of place just roughly place it back to where you had it before the constraint now we create the controller for our torso and parent our armature to the controller then select the body geometry parent that also to the controller and we have a lot of movement already rigged up beautiful now we will constrain each geometry of the lake to the appropriate bone in the armature so you select chart off target armature and select the bone that is right next to it should the geometry jump out of place click set invert and everything should jump back into place and there's our leg here's our torso beautiful all that is missing is a root control that moves everything in synchronicity so you can place your character where uh, you need it um, and that is what we do now parallel to it there you go one good trick about this setup is that you can select all the elements of the legs so geometry armature and the controllers duplicate them and then place them around the rig where you need them and you have more legs for free how good is that okay so let's create those magical particles that contribute so much to the to the feel and the tone of this piece currently they are cached which makes it a little easier for me to talk you through this as i can just scrub through the timeline so let's just uh, go from top to bottom so with my ribbon selected uh we can see here under particle that i created a particle system just by hitting the plus button and it will automatically generate particles from that moment on i limit the particle numbers to 5000 that is a uh, belief per second and they start to admit particles from frame one on and they will stop admitting at frame 450 and have a lifetime of 160 frames i done this because there is a ton of particles in the scene already and I just needed to have uh, enough pre-roll uh, to, to start the shot. So pre-roll is exactly this. The first 20 seconds of the shot, you could say even the first 50 seconds, are not that usable because the particles need a certain amount of time before they start hitting the ground and create those ripples. So if we would cut to the shot right from frame 1, we wouldn't even see particles until frame 20 perhaps, and then ripples not until frame 40. So these frames here are pre-roll for me for this shot, and only from frame 40 on the action is actually happening, and the shot looks the way I wanted it with all the elements in there. It needs to be simulated either way, it just won't be part of the rendering really, or at least not part of the edit, you can render it of course. So rotation is a really important factor here right now to give those particles life. They spin around themselves and as they do so, they, they are, their, their surfaces start to hit highlights and then lose it again. That creates this flickery, pingy feeling, that, that sparkle 
that they create when, when you have thousands of those in the scene is just sparkling all over the show. And if they wouldn't rotate, they might have very static sparkles for some of them and no sparkle at all on other particles. So do give them random rotation. It brings a lot of life into everything. Then here for render, I set it to object and then floaty. And floaty is just really just one single icosphere with a relatively low poly count here. So field weights is the last important setting. I greatly reduce the gravity to 0.15 so that those particles would just float to the ground rather than just falling like a rock and that just gives everything a much a much more gentle and happy sort of tone I think yeah and with that we have we have the particles sorted you I cache them out because in general this is always advice before rendering so that each time you render it uh, the particles have exactly the same position as they have with your first rendering so you don't get any misalignment in your render passes should you use some and in the next chapter we talk about dynamic paint because those particles are also set as a brush for the ground plane which then would create the ripples I love this shot. It was very rewarding and satisfying. We had the particles from our umbrella hitting the puddles, creating those ripples, and it was all beautiful. So what we have here is a ground plane. Give it a good amount of subdivision because the particles are so fine that we create a ton of ripples. We also create another plane. This will be our emitter. So we just go into particles, hit the plus button, and scale it up a bit, apply scale. Maybe reduce the number of particles a bit. And I apologize, this chapter is a bit chaotic because I jumped too much between emitter and the, the, the ground plane. So let's just take all this together and ask me questions in the comments. So the ground plane, we go to dynamics, dynamic paint and set the type to canvas. The emitter, we also go dynamic paint but set the type to brush. So we add the brush and nothing happens right now. With the ground plane, I set the surface type to waves. And the emitter, I set the, the, the paint to particle system. And there I select our particle system. And here we go. It's not very hard, luckily. So shade smooth to make it all a bit nicer. So compositing is relatively basic. There's a few too many notes in here because I had to correct some render issues. I will skip past those and just explain the inputs that we used here. So this is my main render. We see the cobblestones and all the elements we need. Here's the correction for the umbrella because the original that didn't have the shadows coming from the inside. Then we go over to, I think this is the uh, ambient occlusion that I brought in to just get a bit more definition on those curves. Then very important and probably most important here is our mask. Wherever we have white, we have cobblestones, wherever we have black, we will have the water puddles and the ripples coming from those particles hitting the ground. And that looks like this. Very cool. I separated this because I wanted to have more control over the highlights on the ground. So the highlight I wanted on the cobblestones, but I didn't want the reflection of the light in the water. It would have been too glaringly bright. While on the cobblestones it looks just really pleasing. So the puddles don't have that backlight. So the particles are our next note here. I rendered them separately to make compositing of the cobblestones less complicated, plus they're a colorful element and I wanted to have more control over color and glow and everything and the intensity of them so that everything can be nicely balanced with the black and white appeal. Same goes for the butterflies. Just pump a lot of glare in there to make them pop quite nicely and just have more presence in the picture. And this is how I did it. Leave a like and please share this video. I look forward to engage discussions about the nitty-gritty stuff of art and filmmaking. Don't be a stranger and I see you soon.